Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'm pleased to rise today on Motion 44, which seeks to force the government to, and I quote, develop and publicly release within 120 days following the adoption of this motion a comprehensive plan to expand pathways to permanent residency for temporary foreign workers, including international students with significant Canadian work experience in sectors with persistent labour shortages. Furthermore, we're debating the amendment put forward by my colleague from Vancouver East, with whom I sit on the Immigration Committee, and which seeks to strengthen this motion. First off, let me start by saying that this is my first opportunity in this uh, Parliament to speak during private members' business. So I've never ha I've had the chance to speak to multiple government bills and budgets since my re-election by the good folks in Saskatoon West, but it's always a pleasure to discuss ideas that originated from MPs outside of the Prime Minister's inner circle, and I would remind my Liberal colleagues across the road that they have the actual power to implement these things right now. So it's glad to hear, I'm glad to hear them talking uh, positively about this, and I encourage them to actually implement this. In Saskatoon West, like all parts of Canada, our economy is driven through job growth. As our population ages and the boomers retire, we need people to fill those jobs and continue to grow our economy. Like many Western nations, Canada's demographics play against our economic survival. Birth rates in Canada are at a historic low of 1.47 children for every woman. An economy needs a replacement of 2.1 births just to keep the population stable. And that assumes that all people want a, a job and want to work. And unfortunately, as we now know, some people, for one reason or another, would rather take a government check than work. And don't kid yourself, I get emails from constituents demanding that they and the NDP, what, what they and the NDP term as universal basic income uh, gets implemented. And this social experiment replaces working with a government paycheck allowing people to stay home and watch Netflix all day. So not only are we short citizens, not all able-bodied citizens want to work. So how do we fix this problem? Well, for the last 20 years or so, the answer has been immigration. Bringing in people to do the work so-called old-stock Canadians no longer want to do. They, we pick our vegetables, drive our taxis, serve our coffee, drill our oil, mine our lithium for electric cars, drive our big rig trucks, take care of our children and elders, perform our surgeries, fly our planes, mm -hmm. become our members of parliament, and so on. There's actually no limit to the skills that immigrants bring to our country. Yeah, yeah. Madam Speaker, many of my constituents in Saskatoon West know that I support immigration. Conservatives are proponents of immigration. I sit on the Immigration Committee, and I believe in the values and hard work of our immigrants. I take the opportunity when I am back in the riding to meet with Canadians of all backgrounds. Two of the main complaints that I hear about, the issue, uh, uh, hear about is the issue of backlogs and the pathways to permanent residency. Both of these systems are broken. Let me start with backlogs, Madam Speaker. On Sunday, the latest figures reported by the government put the immigration backlog at 2 million people. These are Afghans and Ukrainians waiting, fearing for their lives. These are wives, husbands, children, brothers, sisters, parents, waiting patiently to join their families already in Canada. They're waiting for IRCC to shuffle through the paperwork. Our citizenship backlog sits at almost half a million people. These are people that are now in Canada. They have gone through the immigration backlog successfully applied for and have been accepted for Canadian citizenship, but they're waiting for the day to give that simple oath when that, which will give them the rights and privileges to call themselves a Canadian citizen. Can you believe that? Two and a half million people waiting for the nod of approval from the Liberal Minister. Clearly, there are major problems in the systems we use to manage immigration in our country. We've highlighted some ideas like having the entire process online, complete with notes and reasons for decisions to allow for complete transparency our system badly needs to be modernized and updated, and Conservatives will continue pushing for that. It's the folks on temporary visas that are most vulnerable to the whims of the Minister and his backlogs. Immigrants come to Canada on a wide variety of temporary visas, such as study and work visas. Imagine that we've just spent four years educating someone as a doctor, an engineer, accountant, or something else, and then we send them home. Or a company invests months to train and provide experience to a worker, and then we send them home. Now, sometimes these folks want to return home, and that's just fine. But very often, these people want to stay in Canada. When we send them home, Canada loses out on their talent and skills just when they're blossoming into productive workers. In our last Conservative election platform, we promised to create pathways to permanence for those already living and working in Canada, so long as they are prepared to work hard, contribute to the growth and productivity of Canada, and strengthen our democracy. It does not make sense to attract the best and brightest, providing them with training and knowledge, and then force these people with all their potential to leave. Permanent residency is the best way to achieve this. 
Yes, the Liberals have played around the margins of many immigration programs, such as the temporary resident to permanent resident pathway, Atlanta immigration program, etc. But what have they accomplished? I don't know. Hopefully this motion will pass and force the government to report back and tell us. But here's an easier answer. Permanent residency, Madam Speaker. But permanent residency for which classes of immigrants? Let's tackle that one. Many immigrants come to Canada with credentials in their country of origin that allows them to practice medicine, to be a nurse or a lawyer, drive a big truck, fly a plane, engineer a road, be a plumber or electrician, a boilermaker. But when they come to Canada, either the federal or provincial regulatory body that controls their licensing says that, no, you do not meet our standards. Sometimes that's fair. Perhaps if you're a lawyer coming from India and you speak English and you expect to move to the gas bay to practice law in French, uh, you need to meet certain requirements specific to that province's law association. But in other areas, training is training. An easy example to understand is aviation. If you're qualified to fly a Boeing 737 in Indonesia, you are equally qualified to fly that same plane here, here. in Canada. It's substantially the same. So therefore, a pilot coming from Indonesia should be able to pick up routes, move to Saskatoon, and start flying for WestJet or Air Canada with very minimal training requirements. And in cases where there is some Canadian-specific training required, we need to simplify the process to achieve that education. Indeed, in our election platform, we promised to launch a credential recognition task force to develop new and timely appropriate credential recognition strategies. And I'll be introducing in the House my own private members' legislation soon enough to accomplish this very task, so I encourage all members to look out for that. Here. Madam Speaker, let me touch on the amendment from my colleague from Vancouver Centre. Her amendment is adding that care, the caregiver program to the list of programs that needs to be examined. In the last two studies we have done on the committee, I have asked multiple witnesses about this very program, about caregivers. Many of these folks come from the Philippines and settle in Saskatoon West. And what I hear is unsettling, no pun intended. MD Shervizuman, who is an immigration consultant from my riding of Saskatoon West, appeared at our committee and said, quote, let me focus a little bit about the caregiver program that can be an example of mistreatment to those foreign workers who work hard to protect the vulnerables in our community. This program was offered in 2018, but unfortunately what happened is the priority of the IRCC has shifted to the other programs, end quote. Mr. Gupitap Kals, another immigration consultant from Saskatoon West, also commented on the caregiver program and said, the processing time has been an extensive amount, and because of the lengthy processing, the majority of the applicants' relationship stress are often causing breakdowns in their relationships, with marriages falling apart, re children reaching the age of majority, and other areas. In some cases, employers have either already passed away or the person to be cared for has already reached the age of majority, uh, as is the case with child care providers." End quote. These immigration consultants are on the ground dealing with the failed caregiver program. And I point this out because I had asked the Associate Deputy Minister of Immigration Canada when she was at committee about her thoughts on the caregiver program. She told me that, quote, the caregiver program is one that is a priority for the department, end quote. If a program that is a priority for the, her as Deputy Minister is such an abysmal failure, I hate to imagine what a non-priority program would be doing. Madam Speaker, I want to conclude my remarks by reflecting on the need for compassionate immigration, our refugee program. The wars in Afghanistan and Ukraine have driven home the fact to many Canadians that we can and should be there to welcome people displaced by war. This is a role our country has taken on time and time again. Many immigrants come to Canada in the, wake of their in, in, in the wake of the First or Second World Wars. We know that Hungarians fled here in 56 and Eastern Europeans throughout the Cold War. Japanese, Korean and Vietnamese all fled from conflicts. Hong Kong, Chinese and practitioners of Falun Gong escaping China's basic dictatorship. Stephen Harper brought boatloads of Lebanese over during their war with Israel. And the Syrians were after that. Canada must continue to be open for refugees. But for that to happen, we must fix our immigration system. Eliminate backlogs, implement new technologies, modernize our bureaucracy. Madam Speaker, let's get this motion passed and see what the government says in response, and hopefully we can get on our way. Thank you very much. Yeah.